Hi, I'm Nick Thomas at the Academy of Historical Fencing, and this is five reasons why you are wrong about the spadroon. Now, why five reasons? Well, essentially because there are roughly five major categories that people criticise the spadroon for, and largely it's undeserved, and I'm going to explain why, and essentially why most of you are therefore wrong about it. So, let's get started. Is the spadroon too light, because it's often a criticism that gets levelled against it. Now, the spadroon can vary from approximately 500 grams at the lowest end of the spectrum, and those are unusual, those are the really, really light examples, ranging up to almost a kilo, which puts them at a category in with a lot of sabres and even light broadswords, for example. So there's quite a bit of a variety there, so are they too light? Well, for a start, let's just talk about lightness for a start. This particular spadroon, which is a very typical 1796 spadroon, so this is the one that gets all the hatred, is 750 grams in weight. This is an 1803 infantry officer's sabre, so a contemporary of the spadroon that everybody loves. And this one is 760 grams. There is 10 grams difference between this sabre and this spadroon. And that's why saying a sword is too light doesn't really tell anybody an awful lot. What they're actually talking about is blade mass, and specifically mass distribution. So these two swords might actually weigh basically the same, but the sabre has a much, much wider blade and a lot more mass in the tip. Now that is created through the mass um, uh, distribution of the blade, uh, but also the hilt weights, the length of the blade, and a few other factors. Now, I said this one's 750 grams, there's plenty of um, scope and spectrum within the spadroon range, but let's say a typical spadroon is around 700 to 750 grams, how does that compare to everything else? Because if you're going to say it's too light, well what is everything else that's out there? Well, small swords which are thrust only were usually four to 500 grams, and sometimes a bit less. Sabres, and we're not talking about cavalry sabres because you cannot compare the spadroon to a cavalry weapon, that is not remotely a fair comparison, it's an infantry sword exclusively. So infantry sabres, now they vary an awful lot, but if you go into the 19th century, most infantry sabres are in the 8 to 900 gram range, but there are actually loads that drop down into the 6 to 700 up to about 750 range. So the spadroon actually is not excessively light, it's not unusually light, if you actually handle it, a lot of them, they actually handle a lot like a lot of 19th century sort of Victorian era sabres. Now, not all you have to compare individual examples, but they're not exceptionally light. What they can be is very light at the tip. Now that is because most spadroons, the ones that most people see most often, are fullered all the way to the tip. So they have a fairly narrow blade profile, but they're also fuller, taking out a lot of the weight and mass towards the tip. Whereas if you look at, for example, uh, a lot of Victorian sabres, the fullering will stop in the last third of the blade. That last third, that's where you're actually hitting people ideally, and therefore it has a little bit more mass in the tip. But not necessarily. It depends um, how wide the stock is of the blade, does the fullering necessarily go to the tip, because not all spadroons do. So there are a lot of factors there that determine how much mass is in the tip. But ultimately, the spadroon is not unusually light. For the 18th and 19th century, a weight range of 7 to 800 grams is not particularly light at all. In fact, there are loads of hangers, sabres, cutlass, um, and several other swords that are in this weight range. So it's not unusual. And then you want to talk about balance as well. It's not particularly unusual in its balance. This particular spadroon is 10 centimetres, which is a common balance you'll find with lots of different swords and they can range up to about 12 or 13 as well. So again, within a typical range of a lot of other swords, particularly sabres, for example. Now, is it too short? Well, the regulation spadroon was 32 inch, and when I say regulation, I mean from 1786 onwards until the spadroon left British military service. So they were almost always around 32 inch, sometimes a little under and sometimes a little over, but there's not much variety found with spadroons in blade length. They usually are pretty close to 32 inch. So how does that really compare? Because a lot of people will say that's a short sword. No, it isn't. That is why people are wrong. It is not a short sword. So in the time of the spadroon, actually most infantry sabers were shorter. So this one, for example, is more like 30 inch. They went down to about 28. Um, small swords were around 30 to 32 inch. Uh, 
Cutlass were around about 27 to 29 inch. Even the largest, uh, basically broadswords, the, the largest swords used on foot, were often 32 to 34, which is still within the spadroon range. So ultimately, the spadroon isn't short at all. It's very, very um, uh, typical of its time. In many ways, it's longer than most. It's, it's definitely at the higher end of the scale. And if you exclusively took swords used on foot, because again, it's not fair to compare it to cavalry swords, if you took it exclusively with swords on foot, the spadroon is one of the longest of its era. And even if you move then on to the 19th century, the British regulations say that then was 32 and a half inch, so a minor, minor difference. And let's not forget that people will get a little bit taller as well as you get out of the Industrial Revolution. So the spadroon in itself is not at all a short sword. It's very much a medium length sword, and for its time, and a good while before and after, was actually at the long end of the spectrum for any sword used on foot. Now, the reason people think it's short is because in Hema today, a lot of people are using side swords and rapiers that have a lot of reach on this thing, as well as more sporty sabers that really have pushed the length you know, up for tournament level fencing. So, no, in, in historical terms, in what people were actually using historically, the Spadroon is not a short sword. Protection. This is another category that people love to criticise the Spadroon for, and guess what? They're wrong. Why are they wrong? Well, because most people in today's terms are talking about it from a HEMA perspective, and they're comparing the Spadroon to ball hilted military sabres, basket hilts, some rapier hilts, stuff which was, you know, obviously has a lot more hand protection. But it's not usually that relevant to the argument when you're looking at spadroons because most of those hilt types weren't in use at the time of the spadroon and certainly weren't common. So again, you've got to look at a weapon in its time and place. You wouldn't start taking a cap and ball revolver from, say, the American Civil War and comparing it to something used in World War II. You know, you're talking almost a hundred years apart in terms of technology. So you have to compare the spadroon to what was being used roughly in its time period and then see how it compares to those weapons. So what was being used when the spadroon was around? Well, the small sword was the common civilian weapon, and it often gets compared to the small sword. Well, yes, they do have, usually, both have double shell guards. The significant difference is the small sword has these rings here called analettes, which you do not put your fingers through with this style of uh, small sword. They're purely there for fashion. and. You can already tell from these two swords which one has more protection is the shells of the spadroon are much larger, much thicker and stronger, as is the knuckle bow. This is the part that protects the, um, the handle, the fingers specifically, also called the ward iron back then, and you can see it's much thicker and much stronger. So it has a lot more protection and a lot better protection than a small sword. Now what else was around? Well, of course, Broadswords were still about, so basket-hilted weapons, but not that common. In the time that Spadroon was used, which is roughly the late 17th to the early 19th century, these kind of basket hilts were usually only used by cavalrymen. So once again, you're looking at a cavalry sword and trying to compare it to an infantry one. Now, of course, the Scots at that time were still using basket hilts, and that is a valid exception, or specifically the Highlanders were, because most of the Lowland Scots followed more... Uh, English sword sort of styles at the time. So it is legitimate to say, yes, the Scots had these swords with a lot more hand protection. And that comes with all the extra weight and mass and things like that that comes with that. What else was around? Well, sabres. Sabres were gaining rapidly in popularity in the 18th century. And how does that really look? Well, you initially had stirrup hilts. Then you had slotted hilts becoming common. And it didn't really come to three bars until after the spadroon was gone. So what we're really comparing to is a stirrup hilt, which, incidentally, the spadroon did adopt the stirrup hilt. So that is a stirrup hilt. This, this is called a D-guard stirrup hilt, although you can actually see it has an additional side ring, which is not normally found on sabres. So this is a sabre-style stirrup guard with additional protection. So even in this case where you have a stirrup-shaped guard, it still has more protection than most of the sabres of its similar kind. And then... Slot hilts began to become popular, but you can already tell looking at the spadroon hilt that the protection on the spadroon hilt is still slightly more. You can tell from these two which one has the more protection. 
So, is the spadroon lacking in hand protection? No, not really. Actually, the spadroon has a good bit more protection than average, a lot more than most of the swords in use in its era. So the only thing that tends to have more protection than a spadroon in the time that it was used is the Scots broadsword and certain heavy dragoon swords. And it's worth noting that in the time of the spadroon that lighter dragoons also adopted this exact style of hilt. The other aspect of the guard on a spadroon offers too little protection is that it's made of brass. And this comes up quite a lot, that people just hate brass hilts because they're soft and they're weak and blah blah blah. You're wrong. Why? Because brass was immensely popular. So if you're going to level a criticism of the spadroon that they have a brass guard and therefore it is weak, well you have to then put that same label to most other swords used in that period because most swords around there were using brass guards, so uh, a lot of sabres, Scottish broadswords adopted brass guards as well, hangers, plenty of cutlass, all sorts of swords, and of course small swords used them as well. And let's not forget that going into the 19th century, so this is an 1822 um, pattern infantry officer's sword, so this is what replaced both the spadroon and the sabre that was in use at the time. It had a brass guard and it had a brass guard until the, almost the end of the 19th century. So brass guards lasted on. They simply are easy to manufacture. They can have elaborate detailing with not too much work. They're easy to maintain and they are quite strong. Let's not forget that this is not a training sword that has to take abuse every single week, you know, day after day, constantly taking impacts. I've actually used brass guards and I've used them for hard sparring for months and eventually they break down, although most of sword guards will, but they are absolutely plenty strong enough to do the job when you need it. And the chances are, if you're using an actual uh, real sword that much and that often, you're probably going to suffer a blade failure before you suffer a guard failure. Also, in terms of brass guards, not all spadrons have brass guards. So this one that I showed you earlier, this has a D-guard stirrup hilt with side loop, which is reminiscent of the um, British light cavalry sabres that were coming in in the 1780s that copied very much the Austrian, Hungarian and Polish styles of the time. And this is a strong steel guard that you would find on a sabre. So once again, that is as strong or in fact slightly more protection than a sabre of its day. So spadroons don't have to have brass guards, but let's not criticise brass guards too much. They were very common, very popular and very successful. The spadroon can't cut. Well, this is a really common one. Now, people like to say that the spadroon can't cut, and they actually say it can't thrust either, and we'll get onto that in a little bit. But they say that it can't cut. Now, why would they say that? Ultimately, a blade to cut just needs to actually be sharp. You can actually just, you know, get a, a knife that is sharp enough and cut through tatami, for example. I'm not saying it's going to deliver much in the way of force or power, so it's not great compared to an actual proper sword cut. But the only requirement actually of, of, of actually cutting is a sharp edge. And then, once you've got an edge that can cut, it's about how much mass is coming behind it to deliver power into that blow. So, first of all, can the spadroon hold a good edge? Absolutely yes. Um, they come to a, quite a fine edge. I have sharpened a few of these and they're quite good for cutting. They absolutely can hold a good edge. So the only real question is, um, do they have a mass? And are they too flexible? Because a very flexible sword is hard to cut with. It can cut, but you don't have much in the way of margin for error. Because if you end up with a little bit of flex on your cut, it'll actually not get the edge geometry quite right and it won't cut well at all. It possibly won't cut at all. So is the spadroon too flexible to cut? Does it have too little mass in the tip? Well, let's just look at this example. This is a 1796 pattern NCO or sergeant sword. And if you look at the rigidity in this, it is actually really good. And that is no different to, for example, this lovely Victorian era um, artillery officer's sabre. The flex in this is about the same as the spadroon I just showed you. Now, are there spadroons that are really excessively flexible? Yes. I have one example that you can really just flex around to ridiculous degrees. That is a terrible example of a sword. But let's not forget there are terrible examples of all range of swords. 
Now, there are a fair number of bad ones like that, and I will talk about that a little bit later. So, mass. Let's look at does it have enough mass in the tip to cut? Now, most people will look at a single example or a handful of examples and make up their mind from that. I own 11 original spadroons. I've now handled hundreds and I've done some test cutting with them. So I can tell you there's a lot of variety out there. If you are judging the spadroons by even five, ten examples like I've got, still not anywhere near enough to tell. And my collection is dedicated mostly to the Napoleonic era when the spadroon actually was in use for about 200 years. So mine is also tightened down to a, a specific time period. Does it have enough mass there? Absolutely it does. Part of the problem here is that people think a lot of, in their minds, have got an idea that a lot of historical swords are a lot heavier than they necessarily think. So for example, this is an English back sword. Now the back sword is absolutely well loved today, and it was historically for being an exceptional fighting sword. And how does this compare to a spadroon? Well, I can tell you that without the basket on it, it's exactly like a spadroon blade. Why might that be? Because the late 18th century spadroons are a back sword. The term back sword was rapidly falling from use in the 18th century, and at that point you see terminology slightly adapted in usage, is that in the early spadroon days, spadroons weren't called spadroons at all, they were called shearing swords. Now a shearing sword is double-edged, and it's basically a light broadsword, usually with a handguard something like this, double shelled. And we're talking about from the late 17th century onwards. Now, as time went on, most spadroons became single-edged, and there's a little realisation that defining a blade by how many edges it has isn't actually that useful. What's more important is how agile is it, because that will decide how it's used. So if this back sword, for example, was double the width on the blade, it would be a very, very heavy cutting sword. As it is here, it's actually a mixed cut and thrust and very much spadroon feel in its handling characteristics. And I'll worth, it's worth noting that this one is under one kilo. So if you actually reduce that handguard from a basket to something like the spadroon, it would be in the typical spadroon weight range as well. It also is balance and blade length. So yes, the spadroon actually, when it has a single edge, is a back sword. And it's not even necessarily a light back sword, it's within the typical range of back swords. That's not to say that there aren't some um, particularly light and bad examples of the spadroon. And I said I will go back to this, and I will. Why are there some excessively light examples of specifically the 1796 Regulation Infantry Officer's Sword? Largely because it's the Napoleonic period, and the amount of swords being manufactured is massive. It's a huge scale war, the likes of which the British Army had never known. And a lot of officers, instead of going to a swordsmith, a good quality sword maker, to get a sword, they would go to an outfitter. Why would they do that? Simplicity. Is they have to buy an awful lot of kit. If you look at the list that an officer has to buy, because he's not supplied with any of it, an officer has to buy all of his own equipment, he will go to an outfitter and buy everything. And that's going to be everything from his boots to his breeches to his jacket, and there might be multiple uniforms, there might even be multiple swords, depending on what role he's got to play and if he wants a dress sword or needs a dress sword. And there's a lot of equipment to buy, and they often bought their swords from an outfitter, and as such, you have no idea what kind of quality you're getting. It'll look the part, it will actually meet the regulations, but is it any good? Well, there were some terrible examples. And that is why, at the time, you see the term tailor's sword that exists. And a tailor's sword is exactly that. It's a sword bought from an outfitter, and you just you have the luck of the draw is what you get. You might get a good quality blade, you might get anything. And some of those um, tailor's swords are really particularly bad, very light, very flexible, not good at much of anything. The spadroon can't thrust. Well, of course it can. What do you need for a blade to be able to thrust? Well, it needs to have a good profile. Uh, by that, I mean it needs to go to a narrow point, so you don't want anything too blunt. That's kind of obvious. You know that from kitchen knives. And then, is it rigid enough to go into its target? 
Now, from the perspective of thrusting, you ideally want the stiffest blade you can possibly get, which is why it's not so surprising then that um, small swords, for example, often have these triangular hologram bla blades which are very rigid for their weight, and also that various swords used for armoured fighting, so the stock, for example, or panzer stetcher, also used similar constructions. And if you want to have a sword that is exclusively for thrusting, you're best off having it as rigid as you possibly can. Now obviously, if you make a blade too rigid that isn't strong enough, it'll become brittle. But if you make it strong and reinforced like a triangular section blade, it's not particularly brittle and it's still very, very rigid. So in an ideal world, it would be very stiff. But if you want a sword that also is going to cut, well, you're not going to want that in terms of your edge geometry and blade profile. So it has to compromise a little bit. But how much does it compromise? So I've gone back to an officer's example, and this is again is a really nice typical example. I'm not showing you something which is unusually stiff, if you like. Um, how stiff is it? Well, actually, it is just as stiff as most 19th century infantry sabres. So it absolutely it has a good profile, it absolutely is stiff enough. If you take some of the really bad, bad examples of tailor's swords that have just excessively flexible blades, then yes, there are some spadroons that aren't particularly good at, at thrusting, and those are badly designed. But that is not that is not to say that the spadroon is therefore bad at thrusting. Those are bad examples of thrusting swords. Now, just to give a little bit of comparison in terms of rigidity, going back to this three-edged small sword, which is really nice and rigid, how much flexibility does that have? Well, not much more than that spadroon that I just showed you. Now, in conclusion, I've come to the point that spadroons are basically a back sword. You should love back swords, and you are wrong. <laughs> Is that the conclusion? Well, sort of. Spadroons don't have to be back swords. They can actually be double-edged. Now, you look at this example and you say, oh, that's not, a ba that's not actually a spadroon at all. That's a broadsword. Wrong. This is exactly a spadroon. This is technically called a heavy cavalry dress sword, but that's a terrible term. I mean, it's a, it's a modern term anyway. What it actually is, is a heavy cavalry dismounted service sword. So this is a cavalry officer's sword, heavy cavalry officer's sword, for when he is dismounted. What does that mean? Well, it means that he's in an infantry officer's role, not necessarily on the battlefield, but in various other aspects of his work life. And therefore, this is his spadroon. And whilst you look at it down here and you might think, well, that's very, very broad, although I'll quite simply stop you there and say, there are lots of spadroons that are that wide. That's not excessively wide. It's double-edged. It looks very much like the blade that you'd find on many Scottish broadswords, for example. You go to the tip and suddenly, oh, it's quite narrow. Why is it quite narrow? Because this is a spadroon. It still actually has a fair bit of mass. This one is 811 grams, so it's right in the typical range of Victorian infantry infantry sabres. Going back to uh, this, for example, artillery officer, this is just under 800. This is uh, 798 grams. So you can see this one, they're the same uh, size, but in fact, the this spadroon here is a heavier blade. It balances slightly further forward, and it actually has a little bit more mass in the tip. And you can see this one does not fuller to the tip. And therefore, despite the fact that it's got a narrow blade profile, it's actually quite thick here. Not so much so that it compromises the cutting edge, but it actually has a fair bit of mass in it. And therefore, this is a spadroon, for example, that has a lot more authority. And a lot of the spadroons of the early 18th century have blades exactly like this. So, in conclusion, what really is a spadroon? Well, all it is is a form of backsword, because backswords generally were, not always, but generally were lighter. If you look at William Hope, for example, he defines backswords in the same category as the shearing swords or spadroons as a light, agile, cut and thrust sword. So whilst you can get very heavy backswords, Hope, for example, was under the uh, assumption that the, the way he was describing backswords were as a fast, agile, cut and thrust sword. So the um, spadroon is very much a light backsword or a light broadsword, and it has very similar qualities to a range of sabres, especially when you get sabres going into the 19th century. So what really happened to the spadroon? Why did it just vanish? Because if it's quite a decent sword, 
and they certainly can be, I will not deny the fact that there are some diabolical examples, and I could show you diabolical examples of rapiers and sabers, for example, as well. There are terrible examples of the spadroon, but if it's so great, why did it disappear? Well, let's not forget that it did have around 200 years service life, which is long for any weapon, so it, it can't criticise it too much. That's not exactly a short service. But what really happened to it? Well, it didn't vanish at all, really. What happened is it sort of merged, is in the period that the uh, spadroon was being used, sabres were becoming really, really popular, not just for cavalry, but for infantry usage. And these two were used alongside each other. So if you, for example, got to see the Battle of Waterloo, you would find officers carrying both of these. In theory, line officers, so your regular infantry officers carrying the spadroon, and flank officers, which would be your uh, grenadiers and your light infantry, as well as riflemen and others carrying this. Ultimately, there was a little bit more crossover than that, but that's the, the basic breakdown. Ultimately, what happened is they combined into one. So if we go back to uh, Victorian era sabres, for example, this is an 1822 infantry officer, and this is an 1821 um, light cavalry hilt, but it's actually been made as a Royal Artillery Officer's Sword. And you can just see, you look at it, the blade lengths are roughly spadroon. In fact, this one is unusually large. This one has been specified as a cavalry length example, so this one is a bit of a monster, but that's unusual. Normally, if you look at a pipe back example of an 1822 infantry officer's sword, they are roughly the weight and the balance and the overall blade mass of a spadroon and they have very little uh, in terms of curve as this one for example this one has eight millimeters of curve so technically in british english this is a saber saber is a curved blade but in practical terms eight millimeters of curve is next to nothing really this handles like a straight sword it's just under 800 grams the blade length the mass, the handling characteristics of this sabre are exactly like a number of spadroons. Now, I would say these sabres were a little bit more consistent in their, in their quality as a fighting weapon, going back to, again, some of the really bad examples of the tailor sword of spadroon. But let's also not forget that that is just in the Napoleonic era, and that's the last era of spadroons in the British military service. So you cannot judge spadroons by one era, and you specifically cannot judge them by one pattern. Especially as there are actually some really good examples of that pattern. So this is a 1796 spadroon, and it has plenty of mass. It has 12 centimeter balance, which is actually slightly further forward than this artillery officer's sabre I'm holding. It actually has a little bit more mass in the tip. The rigidity is at least as good. The hand protection is vaguely similar. So don't criticize spadroons too much. There are actually some really good examples and you cannot judge them by those bad examples or by one single pattern. And when a sword or any weapon is in use for 200 years approximately, to some degree it went a little bit further, particularly with things like the, uh, the American NCO sword, which is still a spadroon, it actually had a very long service life, it was very successful, and let's also not forget that some experienced swordsmen like Sir William Hope and Donald McBain absolutely loved them. So for whatever criticism you will see of the Spadroon, historically it's usually regarding some of the particularly bad examples of them, not the whole category of swords, and if you see in Spadroon hatred today, it's because people have jumped on the bandwagon without really knowing anything about them, rarely ever handled them, if at all, not studied them, or know much about them at all. So there you go. Five reasons why you are wrong, or hopefully not wrong now, because you now know a little bit more about Spadroons. And I hope I've opened your eyes a little bit to what the Spadroon is, how it actually is as a weapon, and how it compares, most importantly, to everything else of its day, and a similar period either side, uh, and actually how good or bad it was. And the truth is, there are some bad examples, and there are some great examples, and it was actually a pretty damn decent sword. So uh, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you haven't subscribed, please do so.